Good evening, everyone. It is so good to see you all here and all of the places you are joining us from all over the country and Canada. I am joining you from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, so it is good to be here remotely myself. Uh, and keep as you're joining, let us know where you're from in the chat. Uh, as you join. Uh, and I have a few housekeeping things before we get going with our webinar tonight. So first, as you're chatting, you want to make sure that your chat is set to everyone, not just hosts and panelists. We had that happen a little bit last week. So just make sure your chat is set to everyone. So as you have comments or questions later in the webinar, you can put them in the chat and everyone can follow along. So along those lines, we'll have a question and answer at the end of our time. And you can put those questions either in the chat or there is a place at the bottom of your screen. It's a little Q&A with two talk bubbles. You can click that and put your Q&A there as well. We will be sharing uh, a YouTube playlist where last week's webinar, this week's webinar, and next week's webinar will all appear. So you can go back and watch them. You can share them with friends because we were so blessed uh, hearing from the Reverend Dr. Sarah Lund last week. And I know we will be so blessed this week and next week as well. So we will share that in the chat. Next week, uh, we are, will be welcoming Dr. Lauren Winner who will be talking to us about Sabbath and how Sabbath intersects with our theme, A Weary World Rejoices. So if you were here last week, you heard about our theme, but if you are new this week, we wanna tell you a little bit more. New York Times columnist David Brooks wrote an op-ed entitled, How to Stay Sane in Brutalizing Time. He wrote, everywhere I go, people are coping with an avalanche of negative emotions, shock, pain, contempt, anger, anxiety, fear. And he asks, how can you prevent yourself from becoming embittered, hate-filled, calloused over, suspicious, and desensitized? So this Advent, we want to address this question by offering the balm of healing that the birth of the Christ child promises us. So we will be exploring meditations last week through spiritual psychology, this week through spiritual contemplation, and next week through Sabbath taking, so that we will all be given new eyes and hearts to lead with love in these harsh times. Healing the world begins with healing ourselves, and this is how a weary world rejoices. Thank you, Joe. So happy to see so many of you. This just warms my heart. I'm Dana Corsello, the Canon Vicar of Washington National Cathedral and Joe's co-host for the evening. Tonight, we truly are blessed. Blessed beyond, I mean, any words I can offer you. Tonight, we have Bishop Stephen Charleston. Many of you probably know him through his Facebook reflections. Stephen is a Native American elder whose spiritual writings are read by tens of thousands of people around the world. I asked him tonight before we got on this, before the webinar started, how many folks read his reflections daily? It's 43,000 people. And that does not count the people that pass it along or share it on Facebook or me. I'm one of those who quote him a lot in my morning prayer uh, services that we offer here online at the cathedral. Um, that's why he's here tonight, because I, I was thinking of who is the person um, in our church who can offer truly, as Joe said, a balm for these really brutalizing times through spirituality. And of course, Bishop Charleston came to mind. For those of you who don't know, he is the retired Episcopal Bishop of Alaska. He's the holder of three honorary doctorates. Um, he's a theologian with a long academic career. He was also the Dean of Episcopal Divinity School. 
And most recently, he's written three books, um, Spirit Wheel, Wheel, Spirit Wheel, uh, Meditations from an Indigenous Elder, that he published just this year. And then another book, I think, Bishop Charleston, you may want to speak to this, but you published two books this year. The other one is We Survived the End of the World, Lessons from a Native American on Apocalypse and Hope. And then, of course, his Ladder to the Light. This was published in 2021, um, An Indigenous Elder's Meditations on Hope and Courage. So I, I recommend, and this was could be a really great Christmas gift for those who need um, beautiful writings, but also spiritual encouragement. So you can find many of his books wherever you prefer to buy your books. He's written a lot, but those are three of his most recent. Bishop Charleston lives now in Oklahoma City. He is a citizen of the Choctaw Nation and his family walked the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma in the 1830s. Really just an incredible spiritual elder in the Episcopal Church. And now I would say worldwide for those who were churched and those who consider themselves not churched or those who were not Christian. Um, he has such powerful messages to share with us. And just quickly, allow me to read his meditation from today. Let us be bold in our witness for the time of change is upon us and the dreams of many hang in the balance. Let us be clear in what we say, for there are uncounted numbers listening, waiting for just such a message as we ourselves have been given. Let us be transparent. We are agents of love, workers for peace, stewards of the earth, and members of a community of seekers, united in respect and diverse in opinion. Mm. Just thought that that really spoke to me this morning. So enough of me talking. Um, Bishop Charleston, I now want to welcome you and turn this reflection over to you. And then we'll save time for questions and answers, questions and answering at the end. So please welcome. You're still muted. There I go. Is that working? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. And I hope that what I, I can share will be on this wonderful theme that uh, we're looking at in Advent and how uh, the Native American experience can be a part of that theme, particularly of contemplation. Um, in this in this context so here's what i'd like to do to start off i'd like to invite you please to join me in a, a, a form of time travel i want to start off by asking you to imagine you're one of my ancestors that you are a citizen of the choctaw nation but in 1831 or 1832 and you're on a forced march at night in the rain and those who are marching you into the darkness are taking you somewhere you're not really sure where it's going to be or what will happen when you get there and you don't have time to really think a lot about it because you're more concerned not to lose anyone in your family on the way because the track that you're following is a narrow one through the through the forest and the wilderness and many people wander off at night and are lost, old folks and children. And so it's happened to you. You've looked around and one of your elders is missing and you find yourself in the rain, running up and down in the dark, calling for someone by name, trying to stop those you see as dark shadowy figures moving past you on the track, other men and women on the march on the trail of tears. And you're frantically calling that name into the night. I want to start with that image for a reason, and it's because that is the spiritual mindset for what I want to describe to you, which ironically is going to be good news. But it starts here in this terrible darkness of the Trail of Tears where my ancestors were forced marched off our land uh, into what is now Oklahoma. And along the way, thousands of us were lost, just like in my imagined story. People wandered off and were never found again. 
it was by all stretches of the imagination an apocalyptic moment for my ancestors. And they are, in fact, survivors of an apocalypse, because if you want to understand what makes people so anxious today and for people be using the word apocalyptic in what they write and read and say, it's because that kind of mindset suddenly begins to happen when everything loses its center and things don't make sense anymore and things don't work. By every calculation of an apocalyptic event, my ancestors lived through one because of what they endured on the Trail of Tears, as well as the loss of their homeland, the loss of their culture, of their language, of their way of life. By every stretch, it was a terrible, terrible experience. And one that most people today ironically can identify with because they feel as though things aren't working well and something bad may happen. And we hear wars and rumors of wars all the time. What made it possible for my ancestors to survive an apocalypse to the level of colonialism in this hemisphere? How did they manage that? Why didn't the Trail of Tears absolutely wipe them out as a people and break their spirit and their will to live and leave them the vanishing people of history? And instead, they survived it and continue to thrive. What do my ancestors offer us as a wisdom, as a pragmatic wisdom that could help us in the time in which we live? That's what I've asked myself. Because that scene we lived through on the Trail of Tears was real for my ancestors. That actually happened. And they are still here. My people are still here telling our story in spite of it. I'll give you three things I want you to meditate on. Uh, three things that my ancestors, when they arrived at the new land, when the Trail of Tears was over and they had to rebuild, there were three things that were important to them. Their family, their faith, and freedom. And I want you to join me in meditating on those this Advent because they're on the mind of a lot of people today. Family, as we talk about family in our culture today, it can become quite a contested issue. Family for Native people is something different, though. If you're time traveling and to become one of my ancestors, family doesn't just mean your immediate family. Family means kinship, a vast network a vast network of, of relationships, not only with other human beings within your own community, but with other living sentient beings around the world. It's an enormously sophisticated take on what a family should be. But for us, for Native people, family is an insistence that our relationship to the earth be that kind of intimate, physical, emotional relationship with a living being because our mother, the earth, is alive. And how we relate to her will make a difference. So family for us is broad as a context of, of talking about the spiritual life. It's vast and, and critical if we're going to turn the corner in this century from the kind of despair that we feel around us all the time. The other one is faith. Watch that again. If you're an indigenous person, if you're time traveling back to feel what that word faith means, translated in your mind is vision. Vision, that's what kept my people going. That's what kept them alive on the Trail of Tears. That's what gave them the strength to start to rebuild. They had the vision of where they were going and what it meant to be a, a member of their community, to be a Chata person, a human being. That's a tremendously powerful image for us because when we talk about vision, we're talking about a context of behavior in which you cannot, in fact, sustain a spiritual vision if there's a lack of truth within it. So integrity, telling the truth, and being a truthful nation, a truthful people, was very important to my ancestors, that a person stood by their word and didn't play around with the truth, but really lived into it. And the whole community understood that when someone said something, they were telling the truth. What a wonderful and powerful world that would be. That's part of vision. It's seeing things as they really are, truthfully are, not scoring points or making things up to make ourselves feel better, but seeing reality as it really is. That's what that's all about. That's what it means to have faith and to have vision. And the last thing, freedom. Oh my goodness. My people have struggled for freedom for so long. 
the the goal of freedom of being free it's it's more than just saying you're uh, you're somehow individually free it's a freedom for all living things freedom for us for a native community for those of you who are time traveling into the chata experience with me i'll tell you those those images of what it means to be free always relate to diversity you can't be a free society if you're not a diverse society being somehow able to incorporate a wide range of thoughts and ideas, of dreams, of visions, of experiences. That's what it means for us to talk about ourselves living into a freedom. It's when all creatures, all people, all men, women, people of different walks of life, uh, why their freedom is important. The freedom to be who you are. You know, this whole thing about genders, it's so interesting. Among so many of our nations, there was always more than two genders. Like the Polynesians, we could have three or four genders at least. And that would be a way to talk about the diversity, the difference that's built into community, that's required if community is to thrive. So my my presentation tonight about something to feel hopeful about or to celebrate or to meditate on would be let us think about these three elements of life and what they say to us now in this time and in this place and how they could help us how understanding what a family really can be how broad that definition can encompass not only men and women of a different race or a culture or a creed, but also living beings and living creatures around the world to feel as though we were in that kind of relationship, that we felt an interconnection, that their lives, the lives of any creature matters as deeply to us as our own, and we're respectful of it. That is one of the most powerful gifts we could bring to bear this Advent and as we go into a new year. And the second one, the one about uh, being full of faith, is being full of vision. See hope. To be hope, we have to see hope. And to see hope, we have to be looking for it and believing in it and willing it to be alive and willing it to be true against all odds. Hope is not that far from courage. And it is powerful. It is the powerful vision of faith. And that's what we as Native people would say could help us through this time of the apocalypse. And what about the last one? What will we say about that? What it means to be free as a people? It means everything. To a Native person, it means everything. To be free, to be who we are, genuinely are. We must not ever even engage the least thought that we would lose that. Do you know what it would feel like to lose that? Not to have freedom. My ancestors understood what it felt like to have freedom taken from them and to continue to believe in it and long for it and wish for it and pray for it and work for it and bring it back to life. When others would say it is long gone and your days of freedom and hope are vanished, my people are a living testimony that that is nothing but, but to malign the truth. For the truth is we are stronger as people than we can possibly imagine. And what we're up against is nothing that we've been called to to do that we cannot do if we have the same kind of faith that my ancestors did on the Trail of Tears. If we can live through an apocalypse as great as colonialism was in North America and Turtle Island, we can live through anything. And we can not only endure an apocalypse, we can help prevent it. We can turn the wheel of time and history, and change, and bequeath to our, our progeny a wonderful vision of hope in a free land where people will be able to be exactly who they want to be without fear, and that we will have families that are as broad as the, as the eye can see, wonderfully integrated through a diversity that gives us all freedom. Does it sound good to you? Does that sound good to any of you? I hope so. It does to me. It does to me. I may have the heart of a poet, but I am a pragmatic prophet, and what I say is truthful. There's a wonderful change that we can we can we can engage right now. This time may seem dark to some, but to others, it may be a time of opportunity for the greatness and the truthfulness of the great wisdom of not only our church, of our faith, whatever we are, our tradition but as a people, what it means to be human, 
to rise up and to feel free and to allow ourselves the joy of knowing that creation matters and has meaning and we're part of it. We'll always be part of it. Well, that's what I wanted to say tonight. I wanted to invite you to walk with me on that trail for just a short while and to look ahead and to see what's coming. I have many times. I've seen what's around the corner, sometimes only dimly, but I have never been afraid. And I think it's because I know what's truthful for all of us, that we are a strong people of faith and that whatever is to come, is going to be something we can handle and more than handle that we can transform. And we will do so, I'm sure of it. I want to be uh, especially grateful to everyone for giving me time to talk. I hope I haven't over-talked. And if you have questions, I really hope you'll ask questions and let me try and respond. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm very grateful to you. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so profound. Um, I don't even, I don't really even know where to begin. Um, I have so many questions. Well, not so many, but um, Joe, do you mind if I jump right in? Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> so I, I agree with everything you said. I can feel it. I can taste it. Family. I mean, I love the way you describe this greater, vast network of kinship. Because I think that's part of what ails our society as we become so isolated and lonely and our, our world to shrink and shrink until this becomes our world. Um, faith. I think this is where I, I, and I'm thinking of other people on this call or on this webinar, because I know many of the people who were here and 140 participants is amazing. So thank you for drawing all these people here. But Stephen, you didn't mention Christ. You didn't mention the, the Christian dimension. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not, I'm, I'm saying, can you explain you as a retired bishop, you as an Episcopalian, you as a retired dean, you as a theologian and academic, where, when you talk about faith and vision, just say more about that or your own evolution. And I know we were time traveling with your ancestors, but can you just talk to us about that? Am I making sense? Sure, I'll be happy to. Uh, the... Uh, very often these days, the conversations I have and the way that I write things are intentionally as diverse or as wide open as I can make it. And there's a Go reason ahead. for that. Um, I, in a, in a very hopeful way, I decided that I would try and open up the doors as wide as I can make them to get people to, to, to come in, meaning through that metaphor, to listen to what I wanted to say. And to build a relationship with people so that we could talk about spiritual things together in lots of different ways. For example, just taking it seriously, just going ahead and being okay to have a spiritual talk or a spiritual point of view for that to matter and for it to be something that people began to understand was a creative thing, that it was something not to be afraid of. Spirituality is not uh, one-dimensional. It's not... Um, it's not new agey. It is, it, we all have a spirituality. And in that process, some people are very, uh, very honestly scared off. If you begin right away talking about Jesus to them, yeah, they're afraid of Jesus. Yeah. Jesus talk makes them uncomfortable. They don't want to hear, oh, oh now you're going to start telling me this. They've already got a loop in their mind. Right. Right. Play, right. You're going to be this, or you're going to tell me that. Um, so I'm very honest with folks that I believe that most of us are hybrid spiritual people, mm -hmm. meaning, and I use myself as an example, I'm a Christian, uh, I follow Native tradition and try and respect and revere that, and I've been heavily influenced and indebted to Buddhism. 
So I, I'm not just a one dimensional kind of guy. Um, when we talk about Jesus in the, in this time in Advent in the vision, uh, my first book was the four vision quests of Jesus. Huh? And when I connected Jesus with vision and what vision quest meant to me as a native person and saw Jesus actually in that role, living into it, dying in it. It was extraordinarily profound for me. And I began to understand Jesus for the first time mm. and felt like everything I had thought of before was now being changed because this was a multidimensional, multicultural Jesus. This was the Christ figure. This was an encounter with the Christ, with that, with that universal, global, in all encompassing embracing sense of the divine that is the incarnation and so for me i could wax more eloquent about the role of jesus in uh, my own life which honestly i tend to be a very simple jesus believer and um and invite everybody to learn more uh, please if you don't know who jesus is take some time and and delve into it because uh, it's been life changing for me. So yes, I'm very proudly still a Jesus follower and a believer, um, uh -huh. and and I'm surprisingly conservative. I, I'm surprisingly <laughs> <You are? laughs> about I am about my little faith and the thing I believe. And boy, I just I hold on to it. You know, it really helps me a lot. So I encourage other Jesus followers to please be a part of this experience together. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really helpful because what I wondered is, and Joe, I'm going to let you after this, but, you know, I'm thinking out loud here, but as you were talking about colonialism and sometimes the empire of the church, it's just can be oppressive. And, and I wondered if when you, with the vision part and the freedom part um, and just what's happened to native indigenous peoples, <clears throat> that you were, it was a response to the empire always, you know, trying to squash or trying to determine what, how we, our language, just everything you mentioned. So that was a really, that was really helpful and beautiful because we are all spiritual sentient beings, as you said, and are, and need to, and um, I, I'd like to say, it's our call to try to be more open. So I, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. Our first question from the chat uh, is from Jeffrey. And we had some misspellings, so I'm going to try and translate. But I think he says, how do we translate what you are talking about into our lives today? Um, I'll just throw out a couple of ideas. One is uh, when we encounter cu culturally encounter one another, um, whatever our cultural background is, when you encounter Native American culture, um, it is uh, it is something to recognize in terms of one of the the good ways to try and do it is to take time not to feel rushed or hurried. We're people that move at our own pace. And so it's more to get to work with us and know us is an invitation to um, to learn uh, a kind of exchange that is, that is built with um, allowing each other to talk things out, to, to really have a dialogue like we're doing here now, to, to let people kind of express themselves and make room for that and allow that. The more we allow that to happen, the broader it gets and the broader it becomes, the more voices we hear and the more voices we hear from people expressing themselves. It, it makes us stronger. It's better for our community. So um, I, I think that's very important. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question exactly, but I think that's really critical. Yeah. There's so many good comments in the chat. Um, Stephen, can you just speak to, and I and it was highlighted, I think, by Margaret. Uh, you said love is not that 
far from courage. And I'm sorry, my head is so in the screen, I can't hear because the cathedral bells are going off. <laughs> I'm trying to do this. The cathedral bells are so loud. Um, <laughs> but can you talk about, that's a beautiful quote, what you said. Love is not that far from courage. Can you, what do you, expound on that for us? Well, many times things I write or say are from personal experience, but I'm not maybe aware of it at the time. I don't always just say, oh, wait, now I've got a great con connection I can make there. No, it just happens. Mm -hmm. And I think the struggle I've known in my own life in so many ways, uh, the, the, the really difficult times in my life, I think um, coming to terms honestly with your our own past in a way is... Uh, is one of the more difficult things in spiritual life, but one of the, the best and healing things that we can do um, is to not hold on uh, to everything that has happened before. But when I talk, I think a lot of times I say things just because I, I have no illusions about putting my pants on one leg at a time. I have no thought that I'm anybody's example of what a spiritual life should be i'm not a medicine person and i never say i speak for anybody other than myself not for my tribe not for my people my nation not for anybody but me well that's great except when it isn't <laughs> except <laughs> whenever you know you have to face the side of yourself that's not so much like a wonderful guru that's not the the spiritual ideal about a person who uh, has made mistakes and is sorry and has tried to to learn. Mm -hmm. I think that's so critical to try and learn from what, not so much worried about punishment. I'm worried about not learning. Not and learning. Not learning. I think part of what we're called to do in this life on earth is to learn something. Every one of us is given a lot to learn, things that really are meaningful, really deep for each one of us, that we've learned in a hard way as well as a good way, other ways, joyful yeah. ways, easy ways, fast and fun ways. That's okay. Spirituality should be that too. But yeah. if we learn something from whatever human experience we have, then I think we have a commonality. Then we can talk to each other. When you're lonely, I can say to you, you know, I felt lonely too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you're worried, I can say, yeah, I know, I, I, I understand and mean it. I, I understand. We become more human to one another. If we're yeah. just cardboard cutouts, which is easy to do in the church, as yeah. you all know, it gets very easy to do that. Yeah. Just be a cardboard cutout and and do and say what you're supposed to, and um, and and avoid avoid a lot of uh, both positive and negative interactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It's, I hope so. Yeah. Oh, good. Do you see this? La what it says. What is your prayer during this Advent season? Sorry, Joe, if I stepped on you, but that was my. <laughs> What do you pray about? Like, what is, what's on your heart? Like, what, what is in your prayers? How do you keep yourself just not with the covers over your head, you know, with all that's going on? And your state's a difficult state sometimes. Well, it's not just that. I'll be, again, you're talking about just trying to say honestly, um, my life uh, over the last year, at least, year and a half, been extremely difficult because of my medical problems that um, my family has faced, either my mother, my father, my spouse, or myself. Been very difficult. So there you go again. When I look at people who write for prayer requests on my Facebook wall because they want a prayer request because of the illnesses, I feel like I can say, I really, I understand. I know what that's like. A lot of my emotion um, at this time, my own prayers, I've been focused on healing in my family and for other people. I don't know why um, it's released in me. I think it does in all of us. It, meaning whatever we face in terms of medical issues in our lives, releases a unique uh, blessing within us. Now, it's hard to, some, to know. Now, I don't know if you all will agree with me or not. Some do and some don't when I say this, but I still will say it. I think that it releases within us some coping mechanism spiritually, some ability, some gyroscope that suddenly allows us to face uncharted waters 
not knowing what's going to happen next. That's hard to keep your equilibrium. And I believe that's one of the great gifts of the Spirit of God of Jesus, is it allows us to have that, that balance. In my ancestors' uh, world, the most important thing uh, spiritually, among, among the most important things, was balance, equilibrium, because we see what happens when we lose it. If you lose balance, you can lose everything. So I think it's an important uh, subject and, um, and one that, that, that our folks can bring a lot to the table. Thank you. We have so many questions, so we'll just see how many we can get through. Uh, Jane asks, would you be willing to talk more about where you find the spiritual source of hope that you speak so confidently about? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And listen, this is very important to all of you. I don't know. I think people look at me and they go, oh, is that he's supposed to be the, he writes the books and things. Yes. And they may think, oh, then you must be that spiritual person, but I'm not. And it's so important that, that, that there's a miracle here. There is a miracle, but it's not, <laughs> but it's not me. Uh, I, I happen to be here and, and why this happens, I don't know. It's, the, it's what I call all, uh, now in my writing, the spirit, the power of the spirit of God, whatever, no, use your own language. I don't want to shut anyone out, but I'm saying it is whatever is holy in the world, whatever is divine and uh, has the, created what we see. That power, that energy uh, can come into my life at times that I really don't expect and do things that I didn't I didn't even understand. I say about what I write is in so many instances, uh, I I may have written this down, but I'm not the author. The author is something else. There's more there's more reality here than than is on the surface. And it's it it's so funny it, for me. It's not a matter of keeping me humble. I mean, what is there not to be humble about? This is just an, an, an act of the spirit of God working to try and help us. That's that's what this is about. How come all of those 40 plus thousand people you are know, part of this experience? That's and that they're they're different from one another. They wouldn't even necessarily uh, vote the same way or or want to want to live next door to each other. Uh -huh. They all show up. What is that doing? What is that saying? It's so powerful and important because right now it feels like our world is exploding and fragmenting into a million different pieces. And here is a force, a force of good-hearted, everyday, ordinary people coming together from all points of the compass, uh, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Wiccan, it doesn't matter. It just literally, my message to folks is it doesn't matter right now. We can argue about that later. We got so much to do. Really, we got to spend another hour or two talking about dancing uh, angels on the hand of the pin. No, there's no time for that. There's so much to be done. And how can you not have hope? Um, look at what is, I mean, that that what I do has been useful to God uh, is miraculous to me in my eyes. It's a miraculous thing. But God works in all of our lives that way. And all we're trying to do now is let's pool what we know and what we've learned. Let's Let's become a community, really across all borders and boundaries with no definitions and then let's do something together to stop and and put the world back on a balance and make it a healthy one this time let's take another step forward not backward we've been there and we know what that is like so a good follow-up uh might be Jesus worked with all people, uh, but then he silenced the crowds when he went away to pray. How do you silence the tragedy in this world in order to stay grounded in your hope? You know, I think in, that I will give um, a little spiritual shout out to, uh, to Buddhism because I have found so much serenity and silence there. I found it meant that in that in their tradition, there is a kind of holy silence. And then, of course, it is in the monastic traditions and in, in Christianity, too. 
but I just happened to find mine experience in when I met people that practiced Zen. And I began practicing Zen, and it was a whole new level of silence. It was really he very healing, and has allowed me to uh, find that kind of quiet spot, that centering that, that we all need to, to know how to get there and what it's about. And I think for me, um, that that has been very helpful, just that simple Buddhist mindfulness of doing things one little step at a time, one act at a time, to be aware. It's very akin to Native tradition, to wake up. The reason we had uh, people who were called the backwards people, they did things backward to the way most people do. Uh, they were there to wake you up. When you saw mm -hmm. them walking naked through a snowstorm, you woke up. When you saw them with a big buffalo skin robe around them by a fireplace in July, and it's crazy. That doesn't make sense. That's the point. So I think um, there's a lot of truth there for us to think about. What What did you call them again? I didn't hear. Backwards? The backward people, the Hayokas, uh, the contraries, the do oh. things in, in a backward way. Okay. Um, they would often walk through the camp backwards. And oh. they do that because then you notice. Uh, if they walk through... Normally, you wouldn't notice. But by doing this, they're visually showing you something. I think it's so amazing that in Native communities, um, traditionally, we're so sophisticated, so incredibly nuanced. There was a genius there. for that, to Just that in that single moment of culture, when someone would walk through a room backward, what an act of art. What an Ooh. absolutely amazing expression of faith. Uh, totally unexpected. Uh, I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have more questions from the the chat and Q and A. Or do you have any, Dana, that you want to? No, pull you out? keep going because I. Okay. This, these are all. I mean, I've seen some of them. They're amazing. There was one. Margaret texted us a really good one. Did you see that one? Well, there are a couple of really good ones that she texted. Okay, go uh, for it. Go for it. <laughs> There are two this so we might not get through everyone's questions tonight and reading all of them they are all so so good okay so how do you explain a sense of forgiveness for the history of colonialism imposed upon your people because it was imposed upon all people mm -hmm. i think the one thing we need to do is stop looking at each other as sort of having these very different separate stories and uh, and I, I appreciate the, the sentiment that people believe, oh, gosh, that Native American is so wonderful and so genuine. Um, we did have colonialism imposed on us. But if you were a, a Caucasian person, you were the first to have it. It began with you. You were taken off the land and put in the factories. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> it, it just seems as I look at it, I think, gosh. I mean, this, th these poor folks were used as cannon fodder. They were used for colonialism, and they were marched around and treated terribly, and um, and all for the sake of empire. I mean, how can you not feel sorry? Now, did those folks make mistakes of their own? Yes. Should we forget that? No, nope. we need to be honest about everybody. We need to tell the truth. It's not easy. Reconciliation doesn't happen because it hurts. And people don't like to do it because it makes you have to be accountable for yourself. And that whole business about family that I talked about in my my little comments, um, you have to be willing to, to be accountable and responsible as a member of that family. And I believe that people of all races are members of one family. And there isn't any one of us that at this point uh, that we ought to we ought to worry about who who's in and who's out. We need everybody in. We need to be very busy because this is a major turning point in the life of all of us. This moment in history will not come again, and it could still roll in different directions. We need everybody to, to put down the argument and pick up uh, each other uh, hand by hand and get to work together because that's what we really need to see happening right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So another question that was given is how can we best invite other Christians to be so inclusive, to be a part of the vision that you have described for us tonight? Don't answer them back, no matter how difficult that is. Wait, say more. What do you mean? Like, give an example. I, I, well, I understand that question. And that is, I have a lot of people write, it sounds great, Bishop, but it'll never work because the, the half of the people in my town are completely off the rails and I can't talk to them. I won't talk to them. They're out of their mind. The, the I'm sure any of you who are uh, at all experienced in daily life uh, notice this going on around you, this kind of, of um, building bunkers of people just know nope, this is my definition for who I am. Are the people in this bunker and that's it? Nobody else can get in. It's awful when you watch this. People are fragment from each other. They say terrible things to each other. And just and and a lot of it makes no sense at all. You you look at it and you go, when you when you ask the question, how could the French Revolution have gotten so crazy? Well, why don't you uh, spend a moment or two and look at how crazy things get here? People say outrageous things, and their sense of, of dehumanizing one another is just completely uh, wrong. And I think it's important to, to name that, somehow to say, no, we can do better than that. There's a way to d have discourse with each other, uh, and, and we need to step up and move to a, a higher plane on that. Mm -hmm. Because you said that was part of the vision. Um, you know... You cannot sustain your vision or your faith without lack of truth, this integrity. If we can be That's true, right. it's who we really are. Vision, vision is only, spiritual vision is only honest. Only it's honest. Never, it's never, um, you know, I have a spiritual vision. You should send me $1,000. Uh, no, you didn't. You don't have a spiritual vision to tell people, send you a thousand dollars. There are those who believe you, and there are those poor people who will do it. But that's not vision. Vision is always truthful. Uh, mm -hmm. It's transparent. It doesn't have to hide uh, because it's it's speaking the truth. And the problem is, in our culture we're in now, is truth. That word has become so weaponized. And used by people in such a um, in ways that most of us can avoid it now. I mean, many people avoid. Well, don't don't get on that issue of truth because if you do, then people just argue with you till the end of the of time. Yeah, so, and that and see that's yeah. the that's the tension though with what's going on in our culture, um, and what I think you're talking about this forgiveness. Uh, it's it's like those of us and all, you know, all of us who profess the gospel, profess the gospel and you, you have a truth and then there's another truth. And then you're, you know, it's hard to love that person when you know that perhaps that's not the truth. And do you know what I mean? Yeah. That it's just. Yeah. My ancestors, well, I think my ancestors, for example, prize truth telling so highly that uh, it'd almost be better to die than than to break that vow or not to tell the truth. Um, and it and if you stop and think about it, it is very difficult. But on the other hand, to simply say the leadership of our country on the highest levels should not play with the truth as though, oh, oops, well, you caught me. I made that up. Like that's normal. Uh and just ex and what we're doing is giving permission for our society to allow people to lower the bar, put everything down, constantly lowering the bar from the sense of integrity and character that Native American thought. When I said I'm I'm a little more conservative than you might imagine, um, I believe that's important, and that's that's something we ought to to recognize that when we're in a family together, when we're in kinship. That works both ways, and there's a responsibility that people take, and they have to be accountable for it. And none of us gets off lightly on that subject. But families are never easy. Families are always hard. <laughs> That's right. I mean, people yeah. act like, oh, my goodness, family's hard. Well, have you ever been to Thanksgiving dinner? I mean, try it. <laughs> 
Well, and it seems to me that with the, the vision and can't sustain a spiritual vision without truth, it, I wonder where ego plays into that. Is the ego creating untruth uh, and telling us stories uh, within that? Uh, I don't know. Does that make any sense? You know what I think? Here's a way to look at it. Um, Native Americans believed in individuality. Western settlers believed in individualism. There's a difference. Mm. Oh. Individualism is ego. That is my way or the highway. I guy can handle this. I'm the top dog here. I'm in charge. That kind of thing. Um, individuality, that's my ancestors. That's people who paint their visions and dreams on their houses. Uh, so you could go by the TP and see what my spiritual truth was in my life at that moment. I, it's a wonderful uh, freedom. Again, it's freedom to, to be who and what you are. But uh the difference between individualism and individuality is very, very big, and it's important. And it's woven into American history. When um, Andrew Jackson uh, decided that he would force all of the Native people across the Mississippi River to get rid of them, uh, that kind of arrogance and just uh, lack of even a civic responsibility is amazing, but it's part of our history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All Joe, right, did you see we... the question that John Alvarez highlighted? I was just okay. going to uh, mention that one. Uh, so he said, as a younger person, so much of the worry today is how we feel so alone and so small. How do we reconnect with one another to make that family and fulfill that vision of faith? Don't give up. There's the first words came to mind. Don't give up. The search you're on, whoever you are, and the sound of my voice, listen very carefully. I'm, I hope this message is directly meant for you. Don't give up. You may not have consciously thought, well, I guess I'll just throw in the towel. But there's a part of you that's tired of this. That it just every day you wake up and hate to look at the news. Because the minute you open your eyes and look at that news, you're going to start worrying. And you won't stop worrying because the people you meet will be worried. And they'll talk about what they're worried about. And then you'll read about it constantly wherever you go on, on your phone. Mm -hmm. So the negativity is, is, is physically there. It's around us. It's the air of apocalypse. The air of apocalypse is heavy with dread, heavy with worry. That's what we're facing now. Spiritually speaking, I hope you all are understanding what I'm saying. Spiritually speaking, that's what we're up against. And what we have to, light to, to, to respond to that is light and hope and love and mercy and goodness. And those things will and always do win. But we can change this apocalyptic time. We can shift it if we're, if we're wise and work together. We can turn this thing around and prevent uh, the kind of fearful apocalypse people are worried about and usher in a different age and a different time. And that can happen. That can happen. It's happened a long, a lot of times in Christianity. It can happen again. All right. Sorry, there's so many. And I know we're running out of time. I think we probably only have time for one more question. Um, I don't know how to choose. <laughs> <laughs> I know we could go on for another hour. Um, oh, so hard. Uh, you touched on Autumn's question. So I'm going to go with how do you describe Jesus to those who do not trust Christians? That, uh, that's the one I wanted. Yeah, thank you. That was good. <laughs> I saw that and then it was fleeting. Yeah. The first person who was uh, abused by Christianity was Jesus of Nazareth. Mm. He, he is a person whose story and image and reality were pre preempted, taken up, and by others, pre uh, uh, taken and used by other people for their own purposes, and who he was as a person, I think, and who he 
was his story, which in its in its simplicity is so powerful, has undergone lots of mutations. The uh, the imperial Jesus or the 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 Jesus who's your pal now, he'll be your friend if you just hang out with him. It, that kind of stuff. So it's okay. That's how life is historically speaking. We go through periods where this waxes and wanes. But now I would say uh, understanding Jesus as um, someone other than what you've been taught, what you've heard, is good. Uh, it sounds heretical, and I, I, as a bishop, I hold the party line for tradition. But to have people who question things, it's good. And they need to understand that the Jesus that they receive, it's like asking each other, which Jesus did you get? Yeah, yeah was that's your Jesus, the issue. Was your Jesus in childhood vengeful mm -hmm. and angry at you? Or was he your pal and would protect you? Children receive both messages and no message. Never heard about Jesus. No idea who Jesus is. So I take Jesus as a word like uh, very, very carefully. It's important how watch how we use it and in what context it's used. And and the Jesus that the majority of people have heard about is not the Jesus that I know or the Jesus I think that we're trying to preach and proclaim to people and offer, invite people to come and just learn about. But the Jesus that, that is uh, healing and good and compassionate and kind and just is a, a figure that all human beings should encounter honestly. And if you, if, if that's all I'll do, I'll just take people to lead them to the door and say, here it is, try it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. We want to, is there anything mm -hmm. else that, what, how are we doing on time? Oh, it's 7.58. Well, I, I feel like my brain is tired. <laughs> you know, trying to take it all in. Um, you've given us so many beautiful and challenging and mind-bending things to think about. From the apocalypse, this uncovering of the truth of, of how we can redefine family. You know, because the church can be family. We can be kin in the most beautiful way when the church is done right, when the church is done healthily. Um, and the freedom, there, there's just so much to unpack here, but thank you for offering it to us in your context, in the mm -hmm. context of your ancestors. I think everyone on this call uh, really appreciates this reframing for us because it's mm -hmm. it's fresh and it's something we, we just always need a new lens to look at god through the spirit through in our own our own church our own in our, our own stories in the context of our faith so wow thank you god bless you and thank you so much for all of you who tuned in um to share this with us. It means so much to Joe and me and Margaret and the cathedral. And Stephen, we're just honored beyond words that you would take the time to be with us. Well, thank you for asking me. It meant a lot. I thought it was important to, to get, to let the word out to help other people. So thank you. Well, especially at this time, Mm -hmm. This particular time in our nation, our, our history, but also what's going on in Israel and Gaza and around the world. This is just, it's really helpful. So would you um, give us the privilege and honor of praying us out and praying us on to our, to the hope of Advent? Yes, I, I'm honored to do so. And I'll do so briefly. Um, there's so much that could be said in a prayer. I invite all of you, just raise your own heart up. You have a lot of things you're praying for and things that are important to you. Lift those up in your heart. And I'll just pray for all of us. I say, dear Lord, I pause now and come to you and pray to you to help all those good men and women who are doing the very best they can to make a difference not only close to home, 
but far away that their things, the things they do in their lives, that it'll make a difference. We thank you so much for them. We ask you to bless them. Now bless each one of us to your use and us to your service. We ask that you will be with us to inspire us and strengthen us in every possible way. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 You notice okay. I use Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we noticed. <laughs> that was great. Okay. Right. No, we loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Thank you all. Uh, Joe and I wish you thank you a beautiful night. And uh, please come back next week. We hope to see all of you back same time, seven o'clock next week for Lauren Winner of Duke Divinity School. I think that will be enlightening in a completely different way, which <laughs> will be exciting. Yeah. All right, Stephen. God bless you. Thank you so much for sharing your heart with us. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Good Take night. Take care, everyone. Blessings.